things can before they start. All right. Yay, we have people joining us. Hello, hello. All right. Welcome, everybody. See everybody kind of popping in. Give, give them a few more minutes. I'm excited to have a new topic. It's not a history topic, but I think it's going to be cool and interesting. Cam's got lots of knowledge in that head of his. Just going to share with us. Lots of opinions. <laughs> That too, don't we all? Get a few more people coming in. If you are here to about getting the most from the hobby, you are in the right place. Very excited to have you. We will get the party started here in just a second. See more people coming in. All right. Uh, so here we are. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I know some more are joining us. We are here about getting the most from the hobby and common football pitfalls to avoid. Uh, when buying your first hobby truck, because, you know, I'm sure all of you have who have done this before have stories, uh, you know, has learned some lessons the hard way, and he's willing to share those uh, with everybody. Just a few housekeeping things for those who haven't joined us. I know I recognize many of the names out there, but for those who are new, uh, if you have a simple question, you can just type it in the Q&A box. If there is an item you wanna bring up for discussion or you have a multi-part question, uh, just something kind of involved, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. For those questions, I do kind of ask if you will wait towards the end for those. Uh, the simple questions, absolutely uh, throw them in the Q&A. Cam will answer them as we go along. So not a problem. If you're having problems, you can talk to me in the chat and we can try and figure them out. Uh, but we are going to get started. The first thing I'm going to do, Cam wanted to kind of know who we have in the audience. So there's going to be a couple of questions that are going to pop up. And if you guys can answer these two questions about where you're from and how many trucks do you currently, hobby trucks do you currently, not working trucks, unless your working truck is your hobby truck. All right. All right, looks like we've got what we're gonna get. And here we go, Cam, here's who we got. Looks like we got a lot of East Coasters and some West Coast. We've got some Canadians joining us and some other, hmm, interesting. And for how many trucks, looks like majority are one. <laughs> We've got some out there who are gluttons for punishment and they have more than two. And uh, you know, shame, shame on me. We forgot to put zero. <laughs> we did forget to put zero. <laughs> oh, <laughs> next right. time. I got, we'll just assume all of the others have zero. So <laughs> there we go. All right. So that's what you've got, Cam. Um, and for that, you can take it away. It's a, your show. Bear with me that I do this right. Yes, take it away from you and give it to me. Yes, Alan has said he put one, but he has none. So yeah. <laughs> that's okay, Alan. Okay, give me one second to get this all situated. 
and Leanna, are we seeing the correct presentation mode? Yes, we are. I can see you. I'm Perfect. Turn my face off so they can focus on you. Okay. Hey, everybody. I appreciate you attending this evening. Uh, this is my first webinar, so I'm getting used to talking to a little black dot, but I've given some convention presentations before and written a few articles. They've usually been on historic topics, Peter Belts and Caterpillar engines, stuff like that. But I've always wanted to do this topic. I feel like it is not discussed enough. And I wanna be clear with everybody, you can take none of my advice and still have a rewarding hobby experience. And I'm basing this upon my observations and experience in the years I've been in the hobby. I'm gonna to try to rush through the beginning here so we have time to discuss the good stuff. A little bit about me. I've been an ATHS member since the mid eighties. I did a little bit of truck shopping then. And, and please understand the, the little boy in those pictures thought just as much about whether velvet ride was a good idea or gee, what sleeper should the truck have? Or well, as a five and three, is that good? Did just as much thinking about that as, uh, a, a, as a 45 year old man. Now, um, I had a few hobby trucks in the nineties as well. I learned to drive back when I was 18, one of my hobby trucks, I moved to California in 2001 and I started buying trucks. Uh, at the time, there were a lot of neat trucks, particularly cab overs in California. And in my collection, I unfortunately topped out at five trucks and three trailers. I say unfortunately, because I was a working stiff with a 50 or 60 hour a week job. And while I made good money, I certainly didn't make enough money to restore five trucks and three trailers. So I decided to come up with a plan. I sold a bunch of stuff and I did one restoration and it took over five years and all of my resources. And in fact, I gradually sold off the other trucks just to support that hobby, to support that, uh, that restoration. So these days I'm down to one restored truck, a trailer for it that is nice and roadworthy, but not ready to go. And I have another truck in the works and another trailer for that one. And I have some orphan, if you've ever gone online and people show you a picture of a truck on a field and someone says, oh, you should save it. Well, I got a truck here I saved and pretty soon I'm going to pass it on to someone else. Anyway, just so it doesn't sound like I'm preaching or glass houses, I, I try to think of the things I'm guilty of that weren't the best ideas looking back. Buying a truck on just a few photos without seeing it, guilty. Wasting a lot of time trying to buy trucks which were not for sale. Visiting a truck every six months or every month for years that weren't for sale. Guilty. Dealing with sellers from whom I should have walked away. And we'll talk about this later, but sometimes it's the seller who queers the deal. It's not, sometimes it's the truck you want, but not the seller you can handle. Uh, buying trucks with no rational plan of how I was ever going to get around to them. I bet if we did a poll... There's a significant number of people who own more than one truck who have no rational plan on how they're ever going to restore all their trucks. Now, if you enjoy owning trucks in your yard and not doing with anything with them, that's okay. It tended to bother me after a while, which is why I narrowed down. Um, having trucks in at least three different storage locations, most of them rented locations, guilty, till I bought a place. Uh, having projects in someone else's yard that went on for five years, Mike Colton's shop always had one of my trucks in there forever. I, in hindsight, I feel terrible about that. Anyway, so these are the kinds of things when you have one big project like I did, I spent five or six years not driving a truck to a show because I didn't have one. Another trend I saw living back east when I was younger, in the winter, you look at pictures of trucks, you get excited to buy a truck, and you're super picky because you're just seeing pictures. And then the convention comes around or your early spring shows and you say to yourself, oh man, none of these trucks at this show are perfect. They're all nice. Even the ones that aren't that nice are nice. I just wish I had a truck. I wish I'd gotten skin in the game. And that used to happen to me almost seasonally. Anyway, enough about me. I'm assuming if you're here, you've joined the ATHS or you know it exists. I assume you may be familiar with the Antique Truck Club of America. If you are from the Northeast or the Pacific, uh, or sorry, the Atlantic seaboard, uh, I, I figure you may have spent some time on Facebook. And I got to admit, 
the Facebook groups are currently the most vibrant old truck community. There's new stuff happening every day. The downside of Facebook is that it's really hampered some of the other online forums that used to be really vibrant, but they're still out there as well. So here's some background. If you're new to the hobby, or if you want to get the most out of the hobby on a daily basis, this is one of the places. Books. I assume we all know this, but it bears repeating. They are a wonderful resource for learning the history and putting a truck in a context. You know, we see at the shows a truck on a, a grassy field. In fact, my next slide shows that. But you want to see what the truck was like when it was in service. And a lot of these history books or photo books give you that background. I love period photos of trucks in service. And these books are also great when you want to jump into the hobby, but you don't know what you want yet. Next slide. See, it skips a slide. Okay, here we go. Go to the shows. I assume you're going to shows. Pandemic uh, accepted, of course. The shows are wonderful networking opportunities. Get active in your local chapters. Getting active in your local chapter sometimes feels like to people, go and do work. But it's also get to know the, the folks in your chapter and the adjacent chapters who are the go-to guys for stuff. Who's the go-to big diesel guy? Who's the go-to Ford guy? Every chapter has folks like that. Every chapter has someone with an amazing collection that you haven't seen at their house of stuff. Let's see here. Another piece of advice I give you. I assume most of the people listening to this have been to an ATHS convention. If you haven't, move heaven and earth to get to an ATHS convention, particularly in the social media age, they have become the premier event. I started going in 1985 when it was in a hotel parking lot. It's grown so much. The other piece of advice I'll give you on this, if you've never traveled across the country or halfway across the country to go to the convention, do it. You see the same trucks if you go to the Southeastern shows. Excuse me, but you may have never seen the trucks in Oregon. And man, that Yakima show, I think 2013, and Salem 2016, just amazing turnout of some really neat trucks that you don't get to see. And if you travel for the convention once, it's very possible that you'll do it again. And you can even maybe con your family into going. The other thing I like about the shows, as I mentioned, it reminds me of the reality. You look at pictures and every truck looks perfect. And then you go shopping and you want too perfect of a truck. At least that's me, I'm a picky guy. But I go to the show and they're there with a the truck and I don't have a truck. And I go, well, none of these trucks are perfect. One of the tricks, it's not even a trick. It's just sound advice. Check that ATHS calendar at the website. It has all the dates. People are always asking on Facebook, where are the dates? Where are the dates? It's on the ATHS calendar. Every show should be there. Plan ahead to attend. Get your local shows on the family calendar. Now, I, I got to admit, I'm, I'm glad, I, I don't think Mike Colton's here. I'm glad he isn't because he would say, you never do this. You're terrible about this. I'm constantly reminding you. That's true. Uh, I, I'm not good at that. But when you get something on the calendar, now your family kind of has to plan around it or at least go to you. Hey, are you going to this thing? But if you don't get it on the family calendar, there's a good chance that they will just plan something else for that weekend and you're out of luck. A, a quick aside, a story. I was part of the group in Southern California that uh, put on the 2004 convention in Fontana, California, the California Speedway. I remember April of 2002 was when we had the first planning meeting for that. It's two years of planning. We notified everybody we knew with old trucks. And I had a neighbor I think he had a wedding or something maybe that he couldn't miss, but, but there were others as well. Someone who misses the show and then they go to you, well, when will it be next year? And you tell them it, it's not going to be here next year. This was like a one shot deal usually. And not only do you have to deal with that, you then have to hear them lamenting that they missed the show for the next three years. Every time you see them like, oh man, I wish I'd made it out to that show. And I we always go, oh, I know. Don't be that guy. That being said, I missed the show this year. It was the first time I've missed it since 2002. So I don't feel too badly, but I wish I'd been there. Okay, here's the bread and butter of this presentation. But Cam, 
I want a truck. Now, here's the question I'm going to ask you. This is the jumping off point. Do you want a truck? And why am I asking you this? Because you want a hobby to be rewarding and fulfilling. Something I've learned in recent years is I, I try not to talk about fun anymore. Getting underneath a truck with a pressure washer and getting coated with grease from head to toe and sloshing towards the house before your wife stops you from getting there is not fun, but it's satisfying. It's fulfilling. And you want that. What you don't want is a hobby that can be a source of frustration, a burden, stressful, or too time consuming of your time and the money that you have available. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about, balancing what you got with what you want and making it work. So stressors, if you got too many trucks in the yard, you've lost the storage, you've had trucks scrapped because they weren't in your control, you hadn't even gotten them home yet. I mean, I know people that all these things have happened to. If you have uh, gotten a truck home, taken it apart, and have no motivation to put it together, not only are you stuck, but now it's hard for you to sell your project. Why? Because it's, it's a part. A lot of nice trucks have been taken apart and then never really fully back together. So maybe right now isn't the best time for you to have a truck. Maybe you got to get the kids out of the house. Maybe uh, if you're military or you have a job that moves you around a lot, maybe you want to come to a point where you're not moving as much. Maybe your living situation. Hey, if you're in New York City, uh, don't buy a truck. Real quick, going to blow through these. You don't need to own a truck to be a serious participant in the antique truck hobby. Models are a great example of something else that's really vibrant that you can do. Here's some of the benefits of models. Obviously, it takes up less space. It's as time consuming as you want it to be. You can spend a year on something. In fact, one of these pictures is a truck made out of matchsticks that a prisoner made. And I'm sure it took hundreds of hours. You get to put trucks in company liveries that no longer exist. You get to recreate trucks that no longer exist. You get to build your dream truck. From what I've seen, I'm not much of a model. I'm not a modeler anymore, but I used to be as a kid. And that's what you see a lot, people building their dream trucks. One of the really wonderful things, the upsides of social media, is that instead of mailing a picture of your model away to Overdrive Magazine and hoping that once a month, they pick you for the model and everyone sees it. On social media, you can show off your builds. It's much more rewarding. You can show them off in progress. There's groups for that. There's, there's all kinds of resources to get attention and input while you're doing it. I'm going too slow. I got to go faster. Other areas of the hobby. This is really picked up in recent years in the shift knob realm. Uh, I just saw a blue glitter Peterbilt knob sell on eBay for $970. The, the shift knob collecting hobby has gone crazy in the last 10 years, but that's not the only area. I've noticed that people enjoy those things that are emblematic of a truck, and that's literally the focal points of the emblems, the shift knobs. But of course, there's all sorts of paraphernalia, those uh, ashtrays. You know, ashtrays and belt buckles are a, a really easy way to collect right now because fewer people smoke and fewer people wear those big belt buckles. So the prices on those items tends to be pretty conservative. It, they're not going crazy these days. So I realize a lot of people who own trucks have these collections, but you can focus on something like this, a, a subset of the hobby and really have a good time and still go to the shows and do all those things. Photos. This is one of the best direct sources of history. It's a great learning tool. Today on Facebook and other social media, there's a constant stream of interesting new photos. I happen to be in a group and there's a guy that runs it from Belarus. I can't find Belarus on a map, but he finds pictures on the internet that I can't find every day. Some of the pictures he posts, I say, oh, that's from that Utah museum archive the state of utah i know where he got that photo that won't come up in a google search but it's out there and the more you dig the more you can find all the commercial car journals uh the quality is not the best but they're all online and scanned 
And you can spend days going through those. And you don't need to own a truck to do this. I collect literature. Now, in the old days, it used to be you wanted that paper. You wanted to smell. It like smelled like the dealership in a way. But these days, I, you know, I, I have spent probably definitely thousands of dollars on sales literature. Right next to me is a big uh, lateral file out of a law office, just full of literature. If I could snap my fingers and have it all be scanned in high resolution and out of my house, I probably would. So it, it doesn't need to be the actual paper. Sometimes it's just the images. One thing I want to mention about photos and literature, one of the things that I'm proud of that I've put together in a hobby that I've spent hours and hours putting together is my Google Drive. I have 55,000 files, all truck related and all organized. And even though it's really time consuming, when you ask me, hey, do you have a picture of uh, a, a traction sander control? I have a folder with uh, three or four pictures of a traction sander control in it. So if you, if you can name it, belt drive uh, uh, tandems, I've got a folder. If you say, oh, I want, uh, you know, Peterbilt 359s, but the ones made from 67 until 70, I have a folder for that. And I use that every day when topics come up on Facebook, it's all accessible by my phone. It syncs to my computer at home. And I save another 100 photos a week, probably. Eh, uh, every week or two, probably. Stuff that comes up, stuff I want to save. And that's just my areas of interest. Are, is my Dodge and Ford and Chevy folder very big? No, but it has some really neat oddball stuff in it that appeals to me. You, if you want to know about a topic that you have a lot of interest in in trucks, commit to writing an article on that topic. I've written on a bunch of miscellaneous things, Alcoa wheels, Caterpillar engines. I've done some Peterbilt articles and it really forces you to get your knowledge together, to do the research, the reading, and then the write it or present it. I presented at the convention a bunch of times since 2004. Also, if you want to write, it doesn't need to be, you know, my articles are like way too big. They're always like, you know, nine, 10, 12 pages. Every chapter newsletter and about half the chapters have newsletters, I believe. They're all starving for content. They would love to print an article. If you can cobble together a couple pictures and a historical narrative, or even the, you know, the history of a company or your restoration project, these are all ways you can enjoy the hobby and you don't need to own a truck to participate. Nope. Cam, I definitely want a truck. So we're going to shift gears here. So th this is this is the buy, buying the right truck and getting there. So here are some of the common pitfalls. I started shopping for an antique truck when I was almost 10. And I know it's hard to imagine unless you know me, but as an almost 10-year-old, I, I I wasn't no less mature in my thinking about trucks. I was just like, focus. You know what I mean? I want this. I want that. And, and I did a lot of talking to people and a lot of listening to older guys. And man, it really paid off because a lot of that knowledge that I got at shows, talking to people in the, in the 80s and 90s, a lot of those guys are gone now. And I'm so glad I spent the time with them. Anyway, a reminder disclaimer there's no right way to buy a truck there's no right way to experience the hobby do it the way you want i'm here to point out all the places where i stepped in the mud or i've seen people step in it too and it one of the threads that's going to go throughout this presentation is the term expectations expectations are so important if someone came to you and gave you 50 dollars, you'd be happy but if someone told you that person was coming to give you $100 and they showed up with $50, you'd be disappointed. It's about setting your expectations commensurate with reality. So common pitfalls, not buying the right truck for me. That's particularly true of first-time buyers. And it's, it's true of multiple-time buyers if they don't really think about how they use a truck. And we'll get into that. Another one, thinking I will save money by spending less money up front. I haven't been able to put a number on it, 
But I always say every dollar you spend buying a truck, you save four or five dollars getting a lesser truck to that point. So I don't have twenty thousand dollars, Cam. I'll I I I want a twenty thousand dollar truck. Well, if you buy a forty five hundred dollar truck and put sixteen thousand in it, there's a good chance you may not have a twenty thousand dollar truck yet. It's just so expensive to do work, so time consuming. Now. Imagine these two scenarios. One person buys a $2,500 truck. They take it apart. They undergo a five-year, three-year restoration. At the end of the day, they somehow manage to put $45,000 in it. It sounds like a lot, but you know that, that, that'll buy you a Camry these days, I think. Um, and then another person buys a used truck. It's not perfect but it's a nice truck and maybe it's $30,000. Well, they don't have $30,000. So let's say they finance half of it. Well, that, that seems like bad advice, Cam. I don't know, financing hobby projects. But if you're paying market value for the truck, the day you want to get rid of that asset, it's going to be worth about $30,000. And for any of us that have been working around trucks and playing around trucks, you know, you can shovel money into a truck that you don't see back. So do you want to start using the truck right away? Or do you want to do it all your way and a big restoration? And I always caution first time truck buyers, my advice to you, and the further you are from the trucking industry, the more applicable this is. Buy a truck that runs and is nearly roadworthy if you can. And, and we'll touch upon that too. So don't start a huge project and disassemble it and then lose interest as the reality of time and money sets in. And Facebook has taught me this trend. I call it visor, bumper, and sold, not having a plan. So someone sees a truck in the field, man, they're really excited, or a truck in someone's yard posted online. They can picture what that truck's gonna look like all restored, they're really excited. They know what visor and what bumper they want. If it's a big diesel truck, they get it home. They don't really have the motivation to like wash the truck inside and out, which is always my first, suggestion get a truck home and just three weekends of nothing but washing or more they put on the visor they put on the bumper we start to see some posts hey gee where can i get a wiring diagram hey gee these peterbilt cab overs where do i get uh parts and then they find out oh well most of those parts aren't available anymore and then 90 days to 18 months later the truck's for sale again and no one says, oh, I lost interest. No one says, well, it's much more, ah, some people do. It's much more project than I thought. Have a plan. Finally, as I already talked about, derailed expectations. That's where it goes bad. Okay, Cam, no, I still definitely want a truck. Step one, talk about, think about yourself, me. What do I enjoy? Am I mechanically inclined? Do I enjoy working on mechanical things? Can I paint? Can I wire? Can I weld? Cam, me, I can't weld. I haven't learned how to do that. So a constant hiccup in my projects is getting a welder over here. Do I have the patience to learn things I don't know? Will one truck hold my attention or will a week later I be looking at something else? That's when you think about modeling and photos and, and other areas of the hobby. Do you get frustrated easily? We all know working on old trucks, it's never gonna go to plan. A bolt is always gonna break. There's no way around it. Uh, am I good at seeing projects through the end? How do I deal with spending money that I don't recoup. I've seen some folks that just can't enjoy a hobby where they spend money that they're not going to see back. Now, it's real hard to do very much, if anything, with hobby trucks and come out on top. I know some people do, but it, it, I've never had good luck with it. And finally, especially when you go to buy that second truck, ask yourself this question that I think almost never gets talked about. Do I have a hard time selling things? Because if you have a hard time selling things and you fill your yard full of trucks, it's going to be an irreconcilable situation. Let's keep on going. I did not grow up in the trucking industry. If you're already in trucking or you're in farming and it's trucking adjacent, or you come from a trucking family, or you work at a dealership, or you have, you're a mechanic, you are already a leg up because you already know where the parts house is. You already know a guy who can weld. You already know the glass company, maybe. You know a, a cat mechanic. Uh, you may know a tow company. You may know people who haul trucks. 
if you're as far removed as I was when I started, not from a trucking family, you have to cultivate all of these resources. And I urge you, if you want to buy a truck, cultivate them before you buy the truck and go to your chapter, go to, you know, do, do, do the legwork before there's nothing stopping you from finding out all the answers to the questions before the truck's in your yard. Okay, step two, we're gonna buzz through this. I'm gonna ask everybody who wants to buy a truck or any project like that, what are your realistic time limitations? You got work if you're not retired. And I should say a lot of retirees, that they have very pretty busy schedules, holidays, family, other hobbies. Very few truck guys don't have their hands in something else. And then going to shows. Do I have enough time to truly enjoy a truck? Is it a manageable project? So here's the whole year. Cam, I don't know what you're talking about. There's 365 days to work on trucks. Well, if you work, that th there went a whole bunch of days to work on trucks. And if you have a job that bleeds over into Saturdays or worse, like a lot of us have had, then you have even fewer days. Well, you got to back up the holidays because your family doesn't want you working on trucks then either. Now, you got to figure your family's going to want you one weekend a year. Don't forget that week in May for the ATHS convention. It's such a pivotal, pivotal, important event to me that I try to go every year. That's where, where it all culminates. There's so much excitement. You got to go if you haven't. And then... Uh, Let's just say your family needs you two weekends a month. And I think if anyone here has a spouse and you said to them, hey, how many weekends a month do you expect me to be around and not working on trucks? The, they're going to say one or two, I would think. And then if you happen to be church going, you now have to cut one of your weekend days in half. So if you remember what the calendar originally looked like, this is kind of sort of what your calendar of truck working days looks like. Uh, hopefully you can steal away some nights. So. It's funny, I see a lot of people who own a bunch of trucks and then I never see them at shows or chapter events because they're always too busy. Um, so it's just time management, such an issue. And, that, and that's the other big step to think about. Step three, resources, delicate subject. You don't have to publish it to the world, but just sit down with yourself. It's like owning a boat. If you've ever heard the joke, a boat's a, a, a hole in the water in which you throw money. Trucks are much the same way. We all think of the purchase price of a truck, but it's not the purchase price because especially if you buy something uh, that's, that's already done or, or you're able to complete a project, it'll have a market value, but you got to have storage. I see a lot of people asking, you know, that they don't really have storage lined up and here they are ready to buy a truck shop space. That was a big problem for me. I was working at my friend's shop for a long time. Restoration. That's another big money suck that people just don't think about. Don't get a project that is longer than your calendar or bigger than your wallet. And you don't have to. And we'll talk about how to be a discriminating buyer. And don't forget your ongoing expenses, insurance, steer tires every seven years, I don't know if you've priced batteries recently, but it's ugly. Um, and, and a constant stream of air hoses and, and other stuff that goes bad. Those are the annual expenses of owning every truck. And in these pictures is a couple of my trucks and my little carport I put up and one of my trucks partially apart uh, and really a restoration that uh, took all of my resources for several years. I said it was a three-step analysis, but I'm kind of circling back. I'm calling it bonus step four. You may not be a perfect judge of your past performance. Ask yourself, then ask a spouse, or if you don't have a spouse, ask your parents or siblings. Hey, do I often lose interest in hobbies? And look around. Is your life already cluttered with other collections? I, I grabbed these pictures off the internet. If you have an MG in your garage that looks like that, don't buy a truck and take it apart. Buy a truck that runs. Um, reality check, your old truck hobby is going to work like your other interests probably, unless you do something actively differently. Okay. 
I love this topic and I could go on forever, but I just have one little slide on it. Back in the eighties, my dad and I, we did an honest old truck search to get me an antique truck because I was so obsessed with them. And we went and saw dozens of people and hobbyists, mostly in New England, but lots of guys who have passed away now who used to be well-known in the hobby. And one day my dad turned to me and he said, you know, it seems like hobbyists fit into three categories. There's guys with one or two nice trucks, which need practically nothing. There's guys with six to 12 decent trucks, all of which need something. Or there's those guys with like 50 to 200 trucks, most of which don't run and none of which are roadworthy or practically none. And I don't know if some of the folks in these categories really ever thought about it. It just kind of happened. And I learned when I got to more than two trucks that I just can't make it happen. So I, I downsize for that reason. Oops, jumping ahead. Hold on. Let me get to this. Okay, here we go. You're, you're, you've decided you want a truck. What's the hobby truck search? Start with what you want. Buyer issues to think about. I've seen this a bunch of times. If you don't know what you want, learn and wait. Your shopping for an antique truck is like the most fun part. Don't rush it. It's, it, and, and I noticed I said fun, not necessarily rewarding. It's exciting going to look at a truck for the first time. But as I mentioned, avoid that first truck in the area. Oh, it's really neat. That Ford out in the field. Is that the truck you really want? Make sure you, it isn't really diesel trucks you want and you're looking at a gas powered truck. Many first truck buyers, I think, buy too quickly. They're not discriminating. So then they have to sell that truck and get what they want. Uh, a quote from an old Genesis song, before you choose, decide. Decide what you want. Don't look at what's out there and say, well, I got to pick one of these. What do you want? It's probably out there. You just have to force yourself to, even if it takes six months or a year. In, in 1997, I sold the two trucks we had and I decided I want to buy a nice truck and a special truck and I had criteria. And I remember being at the 97 convention just dying to own a truck and not having one. And it wasn't until December of 98 that I got one. And it was the right truck and I enjoyed it for almost a decade. Two, don't just focus on year, make, and model. Start asking these other questions when you're searching. A two axle or a three axle? What are my storage requirements? How much space do I have? Do I need a CDL? What's the insurance going to be like? When I say even hobby trucks can be useful, I don't necessarily mean for commercial work, but I mean, if you like big, long three axles, like I have had many of in the past, they don't hardly have any room for a cooler and folding chairs. If you want to go to the show and take a cooler and folding chairs or take a car to the show or haul another truck to the show, plan for that in your shopping. Uh, I've heard this one oh, so many more times than I can count. I'm going to be able to haul a load with it once in a while. I think there's a, a thought that a truck has to earn its keep like a horse. They used to say about horses, unless you already have show trucks and things like that, that are occasional use, I would tell someone who's a one truck buyer, buy a hobby truck, enjoy it as a hobby truck. The commercial insurance and the fact that you're unfamiliar with the truck usually, and now you're trying to make kind of halfway living with it. I, again, this is very much opinion, but I would discourage people from doing that unless they have a lot of familiarity with the truck already and, and they really know what they're doing. Give it a second to load here. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see this. What condition do you really want? I can't emphasize enough by condition. Ask yourself some questions. What projects are you prepared to undertake? Uh, don't buy a truck without power steering and then be asking those feeler questions. Hey, what's it cost to do power steering? How do I put power steering on this truck? How do I put air conditioning? Do I need to totally rewire it? 
determine in your mind and get some background, do some background research. What are you willing to do? How much time do you want to work on the truck before driving it? I always worry about people who have multi-year restoration projects before they ever drove their truck. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but it's always a risk of losing interest if you never see that side of it, I think. And then how much time are you willing to spend researching and sourcing parts? For every hour I worked on my 1979 359 Peterbilt project, I spent two hours researching, trying to figure out how stuff worked, trying to source exactly the right parts. You know, if you have a truck that's 40 years old, you can't, don't go to the auto parts store and say, give me the thing that fits this. Figure out the one you want. A lot of cases, the correct part is still available, but you have to order it or hunt for it. Nothing's going to come easy. So be prepared to spend that time. I see a lot of folks who buy a truck and then say, uh, they post on Facebook, hey, where can I go and just order all this stuff at once? You know, people, uh, it's funny that they, a lot of people kind of cry poverty. And then when they get a truck, it's like, well, I just want to send a credit card number somewhere and get all the stuff in a box. That may work for some muscle cars, but for trucks, we're not there yet for the most part. So be prepared to spend time. And if you're not willing to do this, um, that pushes you more and more towards a truck that's already restored or a truck that's already real nice. Okay. Honestly, part two of our truck search, make a plan. Don't, as I said, don't rush it. Literally get a piece of paper or do it on the notes on your phone. Make a list of the characteristics that are must haves for you. This is going to save you from buying the wrong condition truck or the wrong configuration truck. I must have this. I must have a Cummins. I don't want a cat and I don't want a Detroit. I must have this once. Well, I'd like it to be uh, this wheelbase. I'd love it to be 250 or longer. Okay, decide on a minimum must have condition. Decide on minimum must have other things. But if your minimum must have condition is starts in the yard, yard drives, but isn't roadworthy. If you see a truck you really like and it's got a miss, that truck isn't in your condition. That's outside of your condition. And if you write it down, you force yourself. Preparations, have your storage lined up. Don't buy a truck without storage lined up. Just don't do it. You'll end up sticking it in someone's yard and it'll get backed into the forklift. Don't do it. Have insurance planned, especially if you're driving at home. Uh, there was a time 15 years ago when I was a real truck buyer of hobby trucks and I was constantly buying trucks that I couldn't do anything with. I get them home and I'd have great big plans, but I've already got three other trucks in the line, in the queue. So I constantly could get insurance. I would drive the truck home and make sure I have insurance. You don't want to be driving an uninsured truck, period. And you want to have insurance. You don't want to be posting on, on uh, ATHS page saying, hey, where do I get truck insurance? Do all that before you start shopping. Make inquiries about shipping. Now that's hard unless you know you're going to be getting a truck from out west. But you know, start to put some feelers out. Who are the guys that are always moving trucks for people? And then finally, licensing. If a truck needs a CDL in your state, you want to know that before you buy it. My dad wasn't a, a truck guy, but his observation was collecting was, was important. And this observation, the number one secret to buying the right truck came from him. And I think it is the most important piece of information I can tell you when it comes to selecting a truck. And the number one secret that I've learned that he said, and I've, it's been borne out to be true for uh, 35 years, there is always another truck. There's always another truck out there. You think, oh man, I want this one. And if I don't, you know, don't talk yourself into buying the wrong truck. Why? There's always another truck. Don't ever forget that. Memorize that. There's always another truck. That way you don't get desperate if you encounter problems. Okay, I don't want to go too long. So we're going to go move along here. A few search tips. We all know Facebook, Craigslist, OfferUp. Auctions, there's a bunch of different auction websites. Sometimes you can find stuff that's not well advertised. If you're from Canada, Kijiji's the like Craigslist up there. Use your ATHS resources. 
the back lot in the wheels of time is good. The back lot online is better and updated more currently. Go to your local chapter. The local chapter president knows everybody. If he doesn't know everybody, he knows the guy who knows everybody. The chapters know where your trucks are. A few of my favorite search tips. There was an old ad campaign. Ask the man who owns one. Anyone who's ever restored a truck that was a niche item or rare, like let's just say like a, a freight line or power liner, that's one of the big grill. You talk to those guys and they almost always say, yeah, I should have never started with this one. I should have started with a nicer one. So when you know, when you're known to be the guy that has a power liner, soon everybody calls you every time they see a power liner. Well, you've already got a power liner. So find that guy. Do some shopping through the Showtime magazine. I'm not saying to necessarily buy the trucks that show, show up in the Showtime annual, but if you want a Bullnose Kenworth, find the Bullnose Kenworths and call a guy and say, hey, I'm interested in trying to find a truck like yours. I was wondering, do you know of any good ones around? A lot of times those guys do. ATHS roster helps you get in touch with those folks. Go through your current and past Wheels of Time ads. Sometimes they still own the truck. Sometimes they sold the truck. They know who they sold it to. And it's just the right timing where that guy's gotten bored with the truck because, you know, there's a finite number of trucks in the world. And sometimes you can catch one that's already changed hands. And if you get to someone through the Showtime or an old Wheels of Time ad and you catch him right when he's about to start thinking about selling it and you say, I'm looking for one. And that's his time to go, oh, you know, I guess I would sell mine. You're the first one there. Remember. The way I said about every uh, chapter, there's a guy that knows the trucks. Every great find, except these like rare, not seen in the barn, and that doesn't happen in trucks very often. Every great find was a truck somebody knew about someplace else. Every truck. So I went to Coos Bay, Oregon, and I bought a Freightliner Powerliner years ago. And the way I bought it is someone sent me a picture. Mike McKay sent me a picture of the truck, and the name of the company was on the door. I Googled the name of the company. I dialed the phone and I, whoever answered the phone, I said, is this sweet trucking? They said, yes. I said, do you have a freight liner, power liner? They, the guy said, ah, uh, yes. I said, would you sell it? And he paused for about three seconds and he said, yeah, yeah, I would. And that's how I bought that truck. Everyone in town knew that truck. But when I got it out of there down to where I am, it was a new and exciting truck in my neck of the woods. Along with, there is always another truck, another golden rule, go look in person. Don't rely on photos. Don't rely on me to go inspect it unless you absolutely can't come out. Go look in person. Why? You're not just looking at the truck in person to say to yourself and to see, oh, it's, it's a good truck. It's about like what they said you're also setting up your expectations. Like I said, if someone gave you $50, you'd be thrilled. If someone gave you $50, but someone told you first and set your expectations, they'd be giving you a hundred, you'd be disappointed, even though they're giving you money. So set your expectations. When you look at a picture of a truck, oh man, and I've been doing this forever. We've all been doing this forever. You fill in the things you can't see with perfect, showroom quality, brand new at the dealer attributes. When the truck shows up, a lot of times it's not like that in the parts you can't see. When you see it in person, it sets your expectations. And before you commit to the truck, you can say, this is the way it is. There's no being disappointed. I know what it is before I buy. I think that's really critical for enjoying the truck and not kind of having a bad taste in your mouth. Um, be willing to travel for the right truck especially in the rust belt. I know shipping trucks is expensive, but rust repair is expensive and time consuming. One last thing, let people in your chapter know what you're looking for. Let your friends on Facebook know what you're looking for. Let them do the shopping for you. I constantly am seeing things for sale and thinking, oh, so-and-so was looking for one of those. And I send it over. Seven more slides and we'll be done. Six more slides, I promise. Go through real quick. You see an ad for a truck. You're shopping on the phone. 
Think through the questions you have before you call. Make a list of the stuff you tend to forget. You don't want to get off the phone and say, oh, I forgot to ask the axle ratio. I'd really like to know that. When you call the person back, they may get a false impression that you're more interested in a truck that, than you are. That's certainly not good for negotiation. In the call, you're vetting the truck and you're vetting the seller because the seller sometimes can break the deal. Always ask someone, particularly these days, is the truck yours or are you selling it for someone? Because if somebody's selling a truck for someone else, they likely don't know very much about the truck and they're likely not going to be motivated to tell you very much about the truck. Five, again, this is a great example of after the fact bad, before the fact good. Is the truck titled? Is the title in the name of the seller? If the title and the bill of sale have different names on it, you automatically have a problem. You want to know that before you buy, and you want to know that as part of the negotiation of the price. Ask the guy, have you had it for sale long? Have others been out to look at it? If someone tells you four people have been out to look at it and they're all jerks and cheapskates, then you know everything you need to know about that seller because chances are there weren't four cheapskates coming out to look at it. Set expectations for your in-person. Again, expectations don't just work for you personally. They work for others. So the guy wants you to come out and look at it because he wants you to buy it. So ask him, if I come out and look, will you be able to start it? Will it start? And now he has, to, this is where the rubber hits the road. He has to say, oh yeah, yeah, I'll start it for you. Can I test drive it? And he can say, well, it's not really load worthy. Or yeah, sure. But if you show up and say, well, well, can you start it? Now he'll be saying things like, well, I got to go get the battery charger. So set the expectations ahead of time when he's motivated. Listen for red flags on the phone. And those red flags will typically be more about the seller than the truck. In person, don't take pictures for the first part. Look the truck over. Don't look at what you like. Look for problems. I am wired to pick apart trucks. So I always look for problems. If you don't do that, force yourself. It takes me when I inspect a truck for someone at least 90 minutes of just looking. And I have a little form I fill out even. And if it's a big sleeper three axle, it'll take me over two hours to look at a truck. And my first impression of the truck is rarely the same impression I have when I'm done. It's not always worse. Sometimes it's, well, you know, it's really pretty solid. There's that one big dented fender that really makes it look bad or the headlights are missing, but the rest of it's pretty stand up. So look and spend your time. Take pictures of everything. Digital uh, film is free. I leave a truck inspection for someone else with two to 300 photos of every scratch and ding. But just, you know, you don't want to get home and say, well, how is that fuel tank arranged and not have a picture of it? You want a picture of everything. Look for the mechanical red flags that we all should know. When you show up, the truck's already running or it's warm. They just steam cleaned an engine. They just spray painted an engine. You know, that kind of used car salesman tactics. Talk to the seller in person, chat them up. In person, a lot of times you can get them talking, much the way I am constantly, right? About the sales process, ask them the same questions you did on the phone and listen for changing answers. If the guy can't tell the same story twice to you within a week or two, that's not a good sign. A couple of my favorite memes from Fahrenheit 451, proper handling of engine rebuild paperwork. You got to burn that. You can never save it because in the ads, I always see engine rebuilt, no paperwork. And then from JFK, Rebuilt and then parked. Rebuilt and then parked. Why do they rebuild a truck and then park it? I guess it's possible. But here's the takeaway. Every other truck I've looked at has some story. Assume no unverified story is true. Might be true, but you assume it's not true. Oh, it's freshly rebuilt. And it's painted, spray painted. Assume, it, show me the paperwork. I recently went to look at a commercial truck for someone that was about uh, 20 years old and they said they had engine paperwork and they provided me with a one page unsigned invoice for a rebuild company in Fontana. I called the phone number, they didn't answer and I reported back to the customer. Yeah, it says they rebuilt the engine but I have this one piece of paper and it doesn't tell me anything. 
okay you've got back from your from your shopping spree you've seen trucks pull out that list of prerequisites you wrote down write a pro and con list for that truck no one truck is going to be pro 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 write out the pros and the cons write out a budget to get it home then kind of think out or write out what's your general plan for this truck bring it home take it apart and paint it or bring it home clean it up put tires on it you know write a plan for the first six months of ownership because suddenly you may find yourself spending a lot more money than you thought and then again in the back of your mind what would your exit strategy be overpaying for a truck is fine unless you want to sell it in a year and then you're going to take a bath a little i know we're short on time i apologize we're going so long but um one me personally when i'm thinking about buying a truck that's going to hold my attention I'm looking for rarity, specs, and condition. And I've owned some trucks where it exceeded in one of those three categories. But me personally, unless it exceeds in two of those categories, it just doesn't, doesn't hold my interest. And when you're evaluating these candidates for buying a truck, look at the number of big projects like engine work, paint, frame modification, like a stretch or a sleeper. You can do all of those things but ask yourself, how many of those things do I, I want? You know, putting on power steering. So maybe you, you want to limit to, I'm only going to do two big projects or one big project. Don't buy a truck that needs engine work and power steering and a frame stretch and a sleeper. That's too many projects. I can't say this enough. There's always another truck out there. It's not always what you thought, but there's always another awesome truck out there. Be picky. I don't want to ever hear you tell me the truck isn't what the seller said it was. Caveat emptor, Latin for buyer beware. It's your job. Now, I'm not talking about if they willfully hide major defects, but go out and look at the truck. You, not to mention, it's not just uh, willful ignorance or, or trying to cheat you. A lot of guys' idea of, hey, this is really nice, isn't my idea of really nice. And your idea of really nice may be different. Don't try to buy trucks which aren't for sale. Man, am I guilty of this. You keep visiting that truck in your neighborhood that you'd really love to own, but they don't want to sell it. I Five years into some of these trucks, I just give up. Be prepared for the seller who ruins the sale. No truck is worth you dealing with a seller who basically keeps your money in the truck or a seller who you pay and then before you can pick it up, they die and they wouldn't send you the title or, or anything like that. Be prepared to walk away because the seller is difficult. That will save you so many headaches. We've all heard it from someone else. Oh man, I bought this truck and then all this stuff happened. Kind of poor me. Avoid it on the front end if you can. Seems like every truck has a pending offer. If people say they have a pending offer, just that's an unverified story. Um, in some parts of the country, I hear dealing, you know, make me an offer. What do you think it's worth? Make me an offer. That's always very difficult because you don't want to insult the person, but you don't want to bid against yourself. So I've learned to say, you know, I'm buying a hobby truck. It doesn't earn me any money. It's going to cost me money to, you know, fix it up and stuff. My budget is X dollars. And then, you know, say what your budget is. I mean, you know, adjust it for the fact that you're buying the truck without any work done to it my budget you know my budget seventy five hundred dollars and if the guy goes oh no 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 oh no i i, I wouldn't sell it for any less than twenty five thousand. well that ends the conversation there we go and 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 hopefully he's not too hurt because you're not telling him i won't spend that money on your truck you're telling well this is my budget it could be the greatest truck in the world i just can't afford it get the terms you need before the sale the seller may be willing to pick you up at the airport fuel up the truck and have it ready for you. But if you buy the truck and then ask for those things, they're going to feel put out. The, the guy may be willing to deliver it to your house, but not after you make the deal. Get the terms you need before you lock in the sale. Make it part of the deal. Get it in writing. And a lot of these things apply to us as well. Buyer etiquette. Deposits are non-refundable. Unless you're going to look at a truck and you're not sure you want to buy it or not. And you tell the guy, hey, I'm going to send you $1,000, but I'm going to be there next week. I'm going to look at it. And if I don't want it, do you agree to give me the money back? Fine. But what I always used to run into is some truck rotting in the backyard and you'd go find the owner, 
And the old guy with the coveralls would say, well, a guy gave me $500 to hold that truck in 1993. Well, now the truck's locked up forever. That's bad etiquette. Don't do that. Realistic timeline for removal. When you buy the truck, tell them when you're going to get it out there, out of the yard. And, and that also sets their expectations. If you don't have that conversation, two weeks later, the seller wants the truck gone. If you tell them, it's going to take me 90 days to arrange shipping to you know Maryland from Washington State, they understand. And check in periodically. I'd say every two weeks, drop the guy a call, say, hey, how are you doing? Because your truck is in their yard. I swear we're almost done. After you purchase a truck, get it home as soon as possible. Get all the manuals as soon as possible. Get your build record if it's available. Get the truck in your name, just like the title work. You want to know about title problems first before you restore the truck. No shopping for parts till you get it home. That's a pers personal opinion of mine. Clean, clean, clean. No bumper or visor until the truck is clean. That will tell you how much thirst and hunger and desire you have to really work on the truck, get the truck running. Even if you're gonna take the truck apart maybe, or partially apart, get it running first. Have a punch list of your first goals and resist the urge to take it all apart. I've had trucks before where I started taking stuff apart and then I couldn't find a place to stop. And the last couple of times I just stopped dead and said, I gotta button this thing up and sell it because I'm never gonna stop taking this truck apart. Anyway, I, I apologize for going a whole hour but this is a, a topic that's passionate to me for me because I see a lot of people who uh, make mistakes, including me. So, Leanne. That was great, Cam. Uh, there was a lot of information in there. I hope you guys uh, got some of that. I know uh, Jeff, he was asking if this would be available uh, afterwards. Yes, give us about 24 hours. We'll have it up on our website. Um, but he said, I needed this about four years ago before he went on a multi-truck uh, buying spree. So <laughs> you may save some people a lot of heartache and uh, grief over the next few years. Any questions out there? Anybody have any comments? Uh, anything, you know, we've got a few minutes. Help. Jeffrey raised his hand. Go ahead, Jeffrey Sheritz. Unmute yourself first, though. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. All right. Good. We could. <laughs> All right. Sounds like you need to maybe speak into the mic a little bit or into the phone. Hey, how about now? There we go. That's better. Oh, good. I, all I wanted to say was thank you, Cam. That was awesome. I, I enjoyed every minute of it. It wouldn't have mattered how long it went. Appreciate it. <laughs> No, thank you. Thanks, I really appreciate Jeff. that. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, Jeff Wright. Unmute yourself, Jeff. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. No, I was just saying, Cam, uh, like Lynn said, you know, this was something I needed probably four years ago because now I'm having to do like what you mentioned um, earlier have to look and see which ones I, I really want to keep and what I want to put the effort in fixing up and which ones I want to um, get rid of because I've got a shop that is full of tr trucks and probably needs to be <laughs> expanded on already just to keep up with all the projects I've got. So, but man, I, Hey man, I'm, I'm glad uh, you put this out. This is a, uh, was very good, very good information. I appreciate y'all doing this. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I can tell you, I have a 50s Peterbilt I'm working on. And there were a lot of parts that I think, oh, this is rare. And I've ended up getting two of everything. I've ended up getting a drive axle and then saying, oh, here's a better one. I ended up buying a fuel tank, getting it shipped in from Minnesota. And then, you know, 300 miles from me, a better one turned up. I wasn't even looking for. So I've been telling myself, even with parts, I need to be more discriminating. Sometimes I was just so eager and I've, I've been down that road so many times with whole trucks. We all know what that's like. Yeah, that's, that, that was, um, the kind of one of my things that, you know, I've just been picking up, you know, parts trucks, I guess too. And I was at the convention, of course, here back, 
a couple of weeks ago and I, I might have found a, another parts truck for one of my trucks, but it's, you know, it's kind of one of them things. Sometimes you, you have to get parts trucks just to be able to put, put, put one together or combine two to, to make a decent one. But I don't know. I kind of feel like I've probably taken that to the extreme maybe now. I don't know. <laughs> And it all depends on your capability. Some people want to do that. But I, I the, the general trend I see is people buy trucks that are a bigger project than they were really anticipating or geared up for. And I tell people, be discriminating. That truck is out there. You just have to keep looking. And it's fun. You're, you know, it, it. I didn't feel, I felt a little anxious spending 12 months or whatever it was back then. But I finally found the right truck and it was really worth it at the time for right. me. Right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. I don't want to hold y'all up. Appreciate it. (laughs) Thanks, Jeff. Don Don had his hand up. Don, go ahead. Yes, uh, Don Hubbard. I'm up here in Canada. Cam, thanks very much for the presentation. I was a little late coming on, but uh, your comments about title, uh, I ran into that issue in Colorado. Uh, Not that there was anything uh, wrong with the the deal. I was buying a truck there. I got to know the fellow and he came down and we had a good look at it and couldn't find the title and um, we were able to get a duplicate made, but uh, coming from USA up into Canada with a vehicle and if everything isn't just right, big trouble at the border. So um, that, that's a real good point to bear in mind, especially if you're going out of country. I don't know what it's like going from one state to another down there, but um, up here, it wouldn't be a problem going across Canada, but going across that line is a big deal. Well, and I, I could tell you, I happen to have a, uh... A fair number of friends in the Ontario area, Chris Hall, I know Billy Baker, I know mm. the Proctors, I know, I forget all the people, Ke- uh, Trelford, I know a lot of those guys. And when you've done it, and, and here's a good example, there's going to be people, if you're, a, I know you're not necessarily, but if you're a first time truck buyer in Canada, talk to the guys in the chapter who have done it a hundred times already. You know, and, and, and the border is, is an issue. And that's a good example of the kind of thing that would stop someone, someone uh, cold in their tracks. But if you know, you're probably going to get something from the States, that's always something you can do the legwork in in advance. And uh, you know, the different States, sometimes the gaps work in your benefit and sometimes they work against you, but paperwork, when it's not right, you can know what the seller has go to the DMV or go to someone and, and figure out what you can do. And now it's part of the price. Now the price is lower. They don't have a title. It's going to cost this much to fix it. And that's a negotiation point. All that stuff matters. You want it to matter before you pay. Declaration of, of, uh, of price is a huge uh, item. When you come to the border, the Canadian customs will be all over you regarding price, especially if the price is lower than what they think it should be. And they will investigate and if they catch you uh, not claiming the proper price, big trouble. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, and that 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 is an issue. That is potentially an issue here too, but it doesn't seem to come to fruition very often. No, it shouldn't. All right. Thanks again. Thanks, Don. Uh, we've had a lot of people who appreciate this. Uh, Cam, you're getting kudos uh, left and right. They love it. Um, so, but those of you who have uh, done this or have seen this, pass the word. Uh, we will have this posted. I'm going to uh, steal this back from you, Cam. Sure. And I should say for anyone who says, I wish I had this four years ago, when you see that younger guy that needs it now, tell us, direct them to, to it or to me. And, and, and I'm always happy to, to help. Yep. We will have this, give us about 24 hours and we will have this up on our website at eths.org slash webinars. So you can go see any of our past webinars we've done over the past year. Can you believe we've been doing this for almost a year, for over a year now Wow! and um, offering these. So it's very exciting. We've got, are actually getting quite the library built up there <laughs> for presentations about everything. Uh, thank you, Cam. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, We look forward to seeing you at our next one. I believe our next one's on Brockways uh, coming up in July. Oh, that'll be good. Exciting. Yeah. So we'll see you then. Check out the schedule and uh, thanks for joining us. Bye.